Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Today, the church does celebrate the first Sunday in the holy season of Lent, and I am basing my sermon this morning upon the epistle appointed for today, coming to us from St. Paul's second epistle written to the Corinthians, beginning in the sixth chapter, which I will read to you right now. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, and in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report, and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Here endeth the epistle. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, my dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to note, dear friends, that in times past, I would dare say certainly from the beginning of the church, up through the many years, lo, the many centuries, up until, quite frankly, quite recently, the whole notion or the idea of someone, if you would ask, who is the minister of God? And if you would ask the average person until very recently, and maybe even still today, when they would ask that question, who is the minister of God, they would respond, well, I guess it's a priest or it's a deacon, it's a bishop, it's a, a religious brother or a sister that teaches in a religious school, for example, or a minister. Someone who, like me right now, is wearing this collar. That would be the idea of who a minister of God is. And yet, we know, as I, as I like to say again, the sons and the daughters of the Most High, without a doubt, we know, dear friends, that we are called, we, you and I, we are called as well. And as St. Paul states here, in this fourth verse of the sixth chapter of his second epistle, written the Corinthians, he as well uses that phrase, the ministers of God. For St. Paul surely knew that God chooses his ministers. God calls his ministers. God affirms as his chosen to do his work here in the world. For not only from the sixth chapter of this epistle that we heard read to us this morning, 
But elsewhere, St. Paul states, and again, now I'm reading from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. We hear the following. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Again, St. Paul is making the point that he was made a minister, not through his own efforts, not through his own gifts, but rather, as he writes, according to the gift of grace of God given unto him by the effectual working of his power, meaning God's power. Very often, dear friends, we stop ourselves, we limit ourselves, we hesitate in being the ministers of God and doing God's work because we in our minds and our hearts even, we question whether or not we have the gift, we have the ability, we question whether we have the know-how, whether we have the courage, whether we have the skill, the list goes on and on. We question whether we can truly do God's work and we also question why in the world, and we scratch our heads, why in the world would God call me? I don't understand why God would call me. If we look throughout Scripture, dear friends, we'll see many examples throughout Scripture. Those who questioned not only why God would call them, but how things would get done. Our lady questioned again, how, how would this be done to her when she did not know man? Again, I'm thinking of, of again, Sarah, when she outright laughed when the angel said that she was pregnant at her old age. So these are just two examples that come to mind very quickly. And yet... It's not necessarily wrong in that sense to question or really actually not to understand. And yet we know that God is the God of the miraculous. God can turn miracles out of ordinary things. As I like to say, in other words, he turns the ordinary into the extraordinary. It is God who is the extra. And this is exactly what St. Paul is stating here in that verse that I just read you from Ephesians. Again, the effectual working of his power, of God's power. Then elsewhere in the Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Again, it is God, as St. Paul writes here, it is God who gives the dispensation to become a minister. But he gives the dispensation to become a minister to do the work of God, to fulfill the work of God, and to do these things on behalf of others. So often, again, it seems throughout time and throughout the ages, we see examples of, of uh, men who have, it seems, called themselves and given to them these various titles and so forth. And they did the, these things so that they could obtain riches or treasures, so that they could, again, uh, receive titles to themselves, meaning titles bringing forth power and glory and fame. 
we must always remember, dear friends, that each and every one of us who are called to be a minister of God, we are called to be his ambassadors here in the world. We are called again to be his voice here in the world. We are called to do the will of God, not the will of ourselves. It is God who calls. It is God who empowers. It is God who gives the skill. It is God who gives the knowledge. And it is to God that we give the glory. So it, it is God who calls us, dear friends. And we are responding to that call. Again, we always have to emphasize the fact, we always have to remember the fact that we are called, and yet we also have to remember the fact of the importance of remembering that we are chosen. We know this is true because in the Gospel of St. John, specifically in chapter 15, verse 16, our Lord states the following words. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring, bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. We should always be cognizant of the fact, dear friends, that number one, as I stated, we are chosen. And as I was saying there at the beginning, sometimes we question, why in the world would God choose me? And yet we know that God has chosen us. Number two, we must always remember, as our Lord reminded us in the verse that I just read to you, we are chosen for a purpose, to bring forth fruit. But also we have to remember that, as our Lord stated, our fruit should remain. Meaning the work that we do as the ministers of God, the work that we do, dear friends, as the ambassadors of God, the work that we do here on earth, to bring the glory to God's name. To give him all the glory. To give him all the praise. To give him all the honor. To minister to those around us that need to hear God's good news. We, as I so often like to state, we are planting seeds. And very often, when you plant a seed, you won't live, you won't be able to see the tree grow into a mighty oak, for example. But you're still called to plant the seed, nonetheless. So too we, dear friends, as Christians, as chosen by God, as sons and daughters of the Most High, we are called to plant the seeds of God. To let others know about his wonderfulness. To let others know about his glory. To let others know about the importance of having a relationship with him. We are called to plant these seeds and then put it in the hands of God to do the rest because we've done all that we can do and now we leave it up to God. So during this day, this holy season of Lent, I should say, dear friends, let us continue our Lenten journey, traveling toward, towards that hill of Calvary, embracing our crosses, knowing that it is our blessed Lord who has gone before us, 
It is our blessed Lord who never calls us to do anything that he himself is not willing to do. And then to prepare ourselves for Easter. To know with surety that God promises us eternal life. But first, we need to do our part by planting seeds and being his ambassadors, his ministers, and respond to his calling. May God bless each and every one of you, dear friends. May God bless your friends, your family, your loved ones. And may God bless each one of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. God bless you, dear friends.